25 years ago today, Knoxville welcomed the world at its front door. One man's idea mushroomed into years of planning and preparation. And when the so-called scruffy little city was transformed into an international showplace, the 1982 World's Fair got underway. It was an event that would earn Knoxville global status. And it's our story. Good evening, I'm Bill Williams. For 184 days in 1982, Knoxville was hostess to the world. But like any good hostess, she had to get her house in order before she could welcome all those guests. There were areas to be cleaned up, roads to be repaired, structures to be built, and the project was not without controversy. But in the end, the city and its citizens came together and pulled off the most spectacular success story ever. Now, there were all kinds of memories. We all have our favorite memories. And in the next hour, we'll relive some of those memories and remind you of some you may have forgotten. There was a technology, the cutting edge technology shown at many of the exhibits, technology which now seems archaic. Some of those ideas did progress. Many didn't go any further than this fair site. But before we dig into those archives, Let's hear from a man we haven't heard from in years. A man who many say had the most to do with making the 1982 World's Fair here in Knoxville a reality. And that man is Jake Butcher. I, I thought it would just be a, a great if we could have the World's Fair here. Now, if I'd have been successful and, and hadn't had the great debacle in banking that happened to me, we might have been challenging Nashville today. You know, we, we really had things going. Jake Butcher was a front man with the contacts to get things moving. We'll hear more from him later. But there was also a board of directors, a dream team of political and business heavy hitters who were determined to prove that Knoxville could meet the challenge. May 1st, 1982 was just a wonderful day. It was a beautiful day. President Reagan came and uh, I remember uh, the headlines in the paper was, Scruffy Little City Does It. <laughs> the thing that brought Knoxville together was the Wall Street Journal story about the Scruffy Little City. And, uh, you know, it's okay for us to fight among ourselves. But don't let an outsider come in and tell us that we're not, not so good. And, and I think it was saying, all right, you know, by golly, we're going to do this. It just seemed like it didn't make any difference uh, who you were, what you were. Everybody came together in order to make it happen. So it was just a remarkable achievement for this community, and a lot of people deserve a lot of credit for it. You know, sometimes I've often said my uh, main management tool was ignorance, is that we didn't know we couldn't do it. We didn't, you know, people would say, well, you're doing what, where? And we say, well, uh, and we didn't know enough to know that we couldn't pull this together in Knoxville. Well, the biggest struggle we had to overcome was the, uh, we knew we could do it, but the world perhaps didn't know we could do it. I'm a little bit prejudiced, you understand, but I'd have to have to say it was a, a tremendous success. A lot of people really thought, hey, we can't do this, is it worth it? The people coming to town, they'll, they'll <laughs> you know, it'll be a mess. But it really wasn't. It, it, came, it came off in a remarkably smooth way. And I think in the end, uh, the naysayers were all proved wrong and not, Knoxville did it. And I think it made everybody in Knoxville feel better. It really, really did. The fair was a marketer's dream come true. Companies and corporations set up exhibits to show off their latest technology. They had a captive audience, tens and tens and tens of thousands of people coming to the fair every day. They were stunned, impressed with what they saw. Is that for real? The Lifestyles and Technology Center was the place to go to see all these advancements in modern technology. Here, Texaco introduced its new gas pump to the public. The interactive display showed people that by swiping a Texaco credit card and entering an ID number, you could actually pump and pay at any time of the day, even when the gas station was closed. And it would even give you a receipt for your purchase. Just imagine that. They were mainly designed for convenience. They're very convenient to the customer. They're open 24 hours a day. 
Also, they cut down on theft, things like that. Well, I think there's a thing in the future, and it? very interesting to operate. Were they pretty simple to operate? Oh, very much so. All you got to do is just answer the machine. These Texaco pumps are one of the many new innovations. In 1982, this gas pump was the thing of the future. 25 years later, it's just a typical pump. The gas that it's pumping, however, has gone from an average of $1.34 a gallon to twice that 25 years later. Hey, can I look at it? Okay, how about this one? A Lincoln Continental with a built-in mobile phone. Kathy, this is a relatively simple uh, system to operate. You dial your number um, through the uh, electronic instrument panel on the dashboard. It's located here. And uh, you talk through a concealed microphone in the sun visor, and you hear over the car radio speakers. Every 15 to 20 minutes, some lucky person standing in line to enter the Cathedral Line home is chosen to try out this phone system by making a long-distance phone call anywhere in the world for three minutes, courtesy of the Ford Motor Company. Hello, David. Yeah. Hey, this is Mark. You ain't never gonna believe where I am. <laughs> I'm gonna take this out. I'm gonna sign a car at the World's Fair. It's about 500 people looking at me. Just think, in a couple of years, we could all be driving down the highway talking to our sun visors. I'm Kathy Kirk for World's Fair Update. In 1982, a car phone was a novelty. 25 years later, there are laws in some states against talking on a cell phone while driving. Here's one more piece of modern technology that had people talking and pulling out their wallets. Visitors to the 1982 World's Fair took a lot of pictures. There was even a Kodak store on site that would loan you a new disc camera for free if you bought the film. But most brought their own cameras, big ones and little ones. And flash cubes. Remember flash cubes? If your camera didn't spit out the picture right away like a Polaroid camera, you could get impatient waiting until you got home to get your film developed. But revolutionary technology on the fair site let visitors get their film processed in just one hour. You know, we offer a custom quality print which is density and color corrected in 60 minutes and we you know people find that you know they're very excited about this. In 1982 at 60 minute photo one hour film developing cost $1.99 for processing and 29 cents for each print. So a roll of 24 exposures will cost about nine dollars. It's not too much more than one hour processing cost 25 years later. Energy turns the world. That was the theme of the International Energy Exposition. We called it the 1982 World's Fair. Exhibits reflected how, as a global society, we use the precious natural resources we have. We also looked at how we could conserve them. The theme of this fair, Energy Turns the World, is appropriate for this decade, as our nation and many of our allies struggle to produce and use energy efficiently to provide for our energy security. We've At the opening the ceremonies, President Ronald Reagan focused his speech on avoiding another energy crisis. In the 70s, there were long gasoline lines, oil embargoes. He hoped the 80s would be different. Together and independently, we've taken steps to make sure that never again will we be so vulnerable. For a homeowner, lowering fuel consumption meant making lifestyle changes. At the Energy Saving House at the World's Fair, homeowners were taught how they could cut back on energy usage by making changes to their heating, cooling, plumbing, and insulation. But there was also alternative housing set up on site for people who wanted to take more drastic measures. Take the Cathedral Light Home, for example. The manufacturer of these geodesic homes says the energy crisis boosted its business. The concern over energy conservation encouraged more people to build a dome home. Wind turbines generate the electrical power, solar energy heats the hot water, and the high curved ceilings allowed the air to circulate. There's less exterior surface area, so when you look at this house, you're looking at less visible surface area, but on the inside, you have just as much square footage. You know, this house would be a normal three-bedroom, two-bath, uh, kitchen, living, dining home. If you'd prefer a solar house, there was one of those to tour as well. Solar panels on the roof draw the heat from the sun. This solar energy is then put to use heating the entire house. The Tennessee Valley Authority had half of a house on display to show visitors examples of energy conservation. It even had a greenhouse to show homeowners how to grow plants. The changes weren't confined to the housing industry. 
The automotive industry had a few things to show off, too, way before hybrids were hip. Now let's take a look into the future with this sleek, futuristic concept car, the AFV, or Alternative Fuel Vehicle, featured here in a dark and light pewter combination. We've already used about 60% of the petroleum in the world, so somewhere down the road we've got to turn to some other means of uh, powering our motor vehicles. If energy didn't interest you, there were a lot of other attractions to enjoy. Up next, we'll look back at two legendary performers who made us laugh and visit two places on the fair site where a good time was guaranteed. Energy was a serious theme for the 1982 World's Fair, but there was plenty of opportunity to lighten the mood. Big name entertainers, legendary ones, stopped in Knoxville to make us laugh. Uh, how are you? I'm happy to see all of you. I don't need... Red Skelton met with reporters and won them over with his humility and humor. He talked about his love of both performing and painting. Like I did some flowers once and somebody said, where'd you get the Van Gogh? I said, it's not a Van Gogh. I painted that. That's a Van Gogh. No, I painted it. Well, boy, you're another Van Gogh. Well, you get to believe this, see? <laughs> so finally my wife says to me one day, she says, what's this nutty stuff about you being Van Gogh? You're a red skeleton. I says, oh, yeah, it's a little nutty. So I felt so ashamed. I went down to the hospital and had him sew my ear back on. <laughs> <laughs> on his 74th birthday, comedian Bob Hope sat down for an interview with Channel 10's Rob Brown. First of all, happy birthday. Thank you very much. Your staff said if I didn't say you were 52 that they wouldn't get their <laughs> checks. <laughs> I've got them brainwashed, haven't I? I've been brainwashing them for years. The natural question is how do you stay looking so young and healthy? Well, I, I know you're trying to butter me up a little just for doing this interview with you. <laughs> but uh, I feel fine. I play a lot of golf and enjoy myself. And, but I black out when I tie my shoes in the morning. <laughs> Bill Cosby, well on his way to becoming legendary himself, also entertained audiences. Every day I have the blues. Now here's a look at just a few of the famous faces who brought their acts to the World's Fair. Especially you ladies who are the main offenders. Before they call him a man. I grew up in, in the Seattle area. And do you recognize this guy? How about now? It's best selling saxophone player Kenny G. He performed at the fair as a member of the Jeff Lorber Fusion. The World's Fair was centered in what is now known as the World's Fair Park, but there were exhibits and events all over the 72-acre site, all the way from downtown Knoxville to the University of Tennessee. One of the busiest places right here in the shadow of Neyland Stadium. It was known as Funland. Riding the giant Ferris wheel is a fond memory for many people who came to the fair. The wheel stood 150 feet high and could carry as many as 240 people at one time, six people to a cabin. It was the largest wheel in the Western Hemisphere, shipped over from Germany, but it almost didn't make it. Because of its size, a lot of the pieces, important pieces, could not fit in the hole of the ship. And on the second shipment, they got into bad weather and a, a portion of it was washed overboard and lost in the Atlantic. Uh, this happened two weeks before the fair was to open on May 1, and we, we frantically had them reproduced in Amsterdam, and they uh, were flown over here by the largest commercial uh, carrier, which is a 747 uh, Flying Tigers nose loader. And uh, when that, that plane touched down and unloaded, it was the first time a plane of that size had landed here at McGee Tyson Airport. In spite of new parts and last minute assembly, they reported no maintenance problems with the Ferris wheel. Now, here's a look at some of the other rides here at Funland.
One place for the grown-ups to have fun was at the Stroh House. Housed inside the empty old Knoxville iron foundry, the German beer garden served German food, played German music, and had plenty of German beer on tap. It drew a crowd every night and brought them to their feet. It's unbelievable. We sat there and we were amazed the first night. We saw people, 1780s, dance down the aisle. We could not believe that we could see these people get carried away as much. We didn't know how people reacted here to this type of thing. When people got up and started dancing on the tables, I tell you the truth, it, it made me feel so good. I said, my God, look at the people enjoy themselves. And Tom, we just sat back and looked at each other and shook our heads. We couldn't believe what was going on. You might not have known many people when you walked into the Stroh House, but by the time you left, you probably made quite a few new friends. The Stroh House has taken on new life after the 1982 World's Fair. The building is now simply called the Foundry. It's rented out for civic meetings, banquets, and special occasions. The planning and preparation it took to pull off the World's Fair required unprecedented cooperation among civic leaders. When we come back, we'll look at the many changes we had to make before we could welcome the world. And we'll hear more from Jake Butcher about his role in the event. World's Fair Park looks a lot different today than it did in 1982. For years after the fair, the court of flags, the waters of the world remained. But a few years ago, it changed. A new convention center is now the centerpiece of the property. It's surrounded by a lake and fountains, and this beautiful lawn used to be the waters of the world. But if you go back 30 years, this was a blighted area, ripe for improvement. It took a community effort to get past the controversy all the way to completion. In the mid-70s, Knoxville leaders needed what they called a quantum jump to revitalize downtown, revive the economy, and attract tourist dollars. The idea was brought forward to have a World's Fair. The plan mushroomed, city leaders came on board, and banker Jake Butcher became the power behind the movement. But there were opponents. Joe Dodd, UT political science professor, was one. It involves a lot of risk. Fair planners asked the city to purchase the proposed site of the fair, a decrepit old train switching yard in the lower Second Creek Valley, 85 acres. It stretches from Henley to 11th Street, from Western Avenue to Fort Loudoun Lake. City Council debated on whether to hold a referendum, allow voters to decide whether to issue $11.6 million in bonds to buy the property. Councilwoman Bernice O'Connor argued for the referendum. Anybody who votes to table this motion tonight is against our referendum. They will not let the people not for vote. Now, I've heard this so many times, I'm sick of it. You voted, but they know out there how you feel about the it. The majority of city council refused to call for a referendum. Bonds were issued. The way was cleared for preparation for the fair, then titled Expo 82. And for the six months that it's open, Expo 82, they say, will attract 70,000 people a day. And Expo opponents said that many visitors would jam the highways. The infamous Malfunction Junction was already a traffic bottleneck. Uh, bringing the folks down Malfunction Junction, where they're going to be backed up almost all the way to Chicago, or at least to the Kentucky state line, I can't see that that's a way to revitalize uh, Central City. But the Department of Transportation promised to fix the interstate problems. We're not doing this because of Expo, but because of Expo, we may be doing it a little bit faster than we normally would. That promise was kept with a new configuration of ramps at the old Malfunction Junction. Governor Lamar Alexander opened the new roadway. Knoxville and Knox County are prepared for our visitors as they come in, both during the World's Fair and more importantly, forever after. While road improvements were taking place, so were improvements here in the lower Second Creek Valley, that old train switching yard. It was a hundred million dollar project. A little more than 10% came to the city to buy the site, the abandoned area in the lower Second Creek Valley. 
The federal government kicked in $12 million for site development, $20 million for the U.S. Pavilion. Banks, including Jake Butcher's United American, put up $30 million in loans. The rest came from corporations, exhibitors, and Knoxvillians who alone contributed a million dollars. As work began on the fair, the State Department of Transportation widened Interstates 40 and 75, rebuilt Malfunction Junction, and completed the I-640 Beltway. As the years, months, and days counted down to opening day, work on the fair site itself was feverish. Old buildings on the periphery of the site, including the Candy Factory, the Ellen Inn Hotel, and the old Knoxville Iron Foundry were renovated. There were naysayers, locally and nationally. The Wall Street Journal published an article that questioned whether a World's Fair could be successful in Knoxville, which the journal called a scruffy little city on the banks of the Tennessee River. In the months prior to the fair, some people who owned rental housing near the fair site evicted about a thousand monthly tenants in order to cash in on high-priced rentals to fair visitors. But during the fair, many of those rentals stayed vacant. Greedy apartment owners lost money. Construction and final spruce up of the exhibits continued even until the last hours before opening day. Then, nearly 100,000 people streamed through the gates on May 1, 1982 to see exhibits by 22 nations, 90 corporations, and six states. And to witness the President of the United States officially open Knoxville's 1982 World's Fair. The idea of having a World's Fair came from Stuart Evans, who at that time was president of the Downtown Knoxville Association. Several key leaders embraced the idea, set out to make it happen. But most people agree that one man who deserves a lot of credit for making it happen was former banker Jake Butcher. It was a big, then a challenge. Then someone, I think, in the Wall Street Journal said, the scruffy little river city. You know, sometimes that's like an in baseball or sports, when somebody ribs you a little bit, you want to try, you want to try a little bit harder. So, then I talked to my banking buddies at NCNB in Charlotte, and then Chemical Bank in New York, and CNS Bank in Atlanta. Some people who I knew very well, and they agreed to help us. So I came up with a plan that the Knoxville Bank, so that it would be the first to put the money in and the last to get paid. Then the East Tennessee banks outside of Knoxville would be second in, second last to be paid. Then I went the line to where. The big banks, like Barclays Bank in London, uh, American Security in Washington, D.C., Chemical Bank in New York, New York, and a couple of other big banks, uh, were the last to put their money in. Well, at that time, the superstructure had begun. So they weren't, they weren't too afraid then because they enjoyed got their money back before they put it in because ticket sales had started then. I knew most of the governors that surrounded Tennessee. So we asked a lot of those people to come back with Tennessee and maybe give us a higher proportionate amount of their federal funds that Tennessee could use to expedite finishing Malfunction Junction. And there's a lot more detail in that to go with it, but it, it was done in, a, in probably about a year and a half or two years when it would have taken 10 years otherwise. It took a lot of people, a lot of different people, and many people have never been credit for it. Sometimes I get a lot of blame, sometimes I get a lot of credit. I probably shouldn't be blamed that much, but I don't deserve all the credit. But uh, there was a lot of people that made this thing happen. The World's Fair was a great success. And one of its lasting images is the Sun Sphere. It's the most recognizable image of the 1982 World's Fair. The Golden Globe was chosen to represent the energy theme of the fair and as a monument to the sun. Traditionally, the World's Fair had one structure that stood above all others. Paris had the Eiffel Tower, Seattle the Space Needle. In Knoxville, that structure was the Sun Sphere. The Sun Sphere stands 266 feet high. The ball is made up of two levels of glass. At the bottom, there's tempered glass on the inside and laminated on the outside. That way, if the inside layer ever broke, the outside layer would catch it, preventing it from crashing to the ground. The reverse is true for the top of the ball. During the World's Fair, the Sun Sphere had two observation decks and three restaurants. This summer, the Sun Sphere will have another observation deck, and a catering company will occupy two floors of the structure. The globe will be available to be rented for receptions. The only other structure built just for the World's Fair that remains is the Tennessee Amphitheater. Plenty of talented people performed on its stage during the fair. 25 years later, the structure is owned by the city of Knoxville. 
It is showing its age, so the city plans to remodel it and open it for use in the fall. The other structure that was built to last was the U.S. Pavilion. It was the largest pavilion on the World's Fair site. It was an imposing site. A $12.4 million cantilevered structure made from steel and glass that stood six stories high. Inside, the crowds who visited saw the complete energy story of our country from 1800 to 1982. It was spread out over 83,000 square feet of exhibition space. When the World's Fair ended, the U.S. Pavilion stood for a while, but later the city decided the land was worth more than the building, and on April 6, 1991, the walls came tumbling down. What was left was sold as scrap metal. 22 nations participated in the World's Fair and visitors got to learn a little bit about each one of them. When we come back, we'll learn about their customs and culture through music and dance. Twenty-two nations put themselves on display at the 1982 World's Fair, and the crown jewel of the pack was the People's Republic of China. It was the first time China had ever taken part in a World's Fair. <laughs> the longest lines were routinely found outside of the Chinese pavilion. During its week of celebration, performers took the stage, but so did politics. Speaking through an interpreter, the Chinese ambassador to the U.S. visited the fair and talk tough about the U.S. role in arms sales to Taiwan. As far as relations between Taiwan and the United States are concerned, the United States and Taiwan can only maintain unofficial relations. But if the United States uh, insists on selling weapons to Taiwan, then relations uh, between China and the United States uh, will be affected. And uh, or worse still, there will be retrogression. On a much lighter note, the talk near the Hungarian pavilion was about the giant Rubik's cubes found outside and inside. The man who invented the color panel puzzle One, is Hungarian two, professor Erno Rubik. Go. He came to the fair to oversee a Rubik's cube competition. The winner, a 14-year-old from Pittsburgh who solved the puzzle in just under 50 seconds. During Japan's National Week at the fair, Japanese dignitaries came to the fair site Traditional Japanese dancers performed, and the fair received a rare visit from Japan's Kabuki Theater. Peru had perhaps the most unusual exhibit. A team of archaeologists unveiled a mummy. The mummy was wrapped in what's called a funeral bundle that looks like this. The unveiling was done before an invited crowd of about 800. The mummy was that of a one to three year old Incan child believed to be five centuries old. Maybe there's something else in the bag that will UT's give us some forensic anthropologist Dr. William Bass participated in the unveiling. Saudi Arabia's announcement caught everyone by surprise. The most dramatic news on the fair site this week was the announcement yesterday by the Saudi Arabian government that it will cancel its country's national week here at the fair. That national week was scheduled to begin next Monday. Stating that this is an inappropriate time to celebrate, officials of the Saudi Arabian pavilion said that funds allocated for the national week celebration will be used to aid Lebanese and Palestinian refugees in war-torn Lebanon. The Philippines exhibit proved to be a popular one so popular, in fact, that it expanded during the fair. The food, the performers. This jeepney all captivated the crowds. The pavilion also received a visit from Philippine First Lady Imelda Marcos. I did not expect this to be this big and um, this uh, well done. The Koreans were eager to show off their culture to the crowd. The ceremonies celebrating Korean National Week were marked with colorful performers. The Koreans wanted everyone to know them because six years later, 
they'd be welcoming the world at the 1988 Olympics in Seoul. And as in Britain, England's famous puppets Punch and Judy entertain the crowds. And to really make a statement, the future King of England was born during Britain's National Week at the fair. Charles and Diana welcomed home their firstborn son, Prince William. Music echoed throughout the fair site. There were marching bands, orchestras, solo artists, all with their own unique sounds, all warmly received by the audiences. We learned a lot about our culture's differences by the traditional dances that were performed here at the fair. Here's a sampling from five continents. many different stages where those performances took place, but a lot of them could be seen under the shade of a big old elm tree. It was the Elm Tree Theater. Developers of the World's Fair site were proud they were able to build around so many trees on the property, 150 in all. But the one tree that stood taller than all the others was a giant old elm. This stately old tree had to stay, and organizers called in a tree doctor to rid it of bugs and pests. We're nursing it uh, to be sure that it uh, stays alive both during for the fair, the fair and afterwards. Soon, with a stage built around it, the elm tree was the background for entertainers from all over the world. The Elm Tree Theater was a main venue at the World's Fair. But a few years after the fair, the old tree was ailing. In the end, it was Mother Nature that claimed the elm with an unexpected bolt of lightning. The rest of the tree was then cut down. The lines to the exhibits could be long, but that didn't mean those waiting were missing out on the entertainment. A lot of performers wandered around the grounds, taking their acts to the people. There was a lot of stuff going on off-site as well. Tomorrow night, super songster James Taylor performs at the Civic Coliseum. And at the Civic Auditorium, a chorus line opens. There are also two more performances of a chorus line on Saturday night. And at Nayland Stadium on Saturday, the Pittsburgh Steelers face off against the New England Patriots. 
The World's Fair site was also the perfect spot for artists to show off their talents. You may not realize this, but the World's Fair had an official artist. He was Peter Max, the painter whose love of color and whimsical styles made him internationally famous. Max painted three posters for the World's Fair. There was something for everyone at the 1982 World's Fair. Visitors were educated, entertained, with an international flair. But sometimes it's the smallest things who are most memorable. When we come back, we'll look at the little things that made a big impression. There was plenty to eat and drink at the 1982 World's Fair. There was fine dining and there was fun dining. Who are these skinny dippers? When two women decided to start a business venture at the World's Fair, the name they gave it really attracted attention. They were selling skinny dippers. Now, there was nothing suggestive or obscene about their food booth. A skinny dipper was a potato skin with a variety of toppings. At most places serve them for appetizers. And we thought that that might go over. And has it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We have done a lot of skinny dipping. <laughs> <laughs> they worked on the project for two years before setting up shop. The skinny dippers sold well. Business was good. But the women admit it was hard work. So if you're looking on another part of the fair site, two men decided to do the same thing. They called their snack Petroleum Bellies. Eh, that name didn't sound too appetizing, so they shortened it to Petros. It's just going to be a temporary little thing, and we're going to have a nice summer job in the fall, take a few months off from school, and I was going to go to law school, and Dale was going to go back and get his MBA, and still have chili under our nails after all these years. One thing that many people got to taste for free was at the Dairyman's exhibit. Small glasses of real cow's milk were handed out to promote milk that was processed differently. It was called UHT milk, and it could be kept on a shelf, unrefrigerated, unopened for three months. The combination of the processing and packaging made it possible. The reviews were mixed. But a different dairy product was much better received. For one day, ice cream day, 12,000 people got free ice cream cups. The giveaway proved to be a cool and sweet way to beat the heat. In 1982, E.T. was in all the movie theaters. Pac-Man was in all the arcades. At the World's Fair, Heinz pickle pins were a popular souvenir, sometimes hard to come by. Here are a couple of more things that might bring back fond memories of the fair. Heinz found a unique way to promote its ketchup. This giant ketchup bottle could be found greeting guests all over the fair site. It delighted all the children and it was a popular photo op for many visitors. Pictures taken at another site on the fairgrounds became part of a popular souvenir. The Kodak booth was the first stop. The stamps were collected in souvenir passports. Each visit to a new pavilion earned you a stamp. It became a contest among many people to see how many stamps they could collect. If you'd rather visit another era rather than another culture, this was a place to capture it all on film. Gene Patterson and Rob Braun did. Oh, come on! It's heads, Rob. Ah, oh, come on. You have to do it. Maybe two out of three? Forget it. A deal's a deal, right? You're, oh, all right. You have to do it. Let's all go. right. Come let's on. Go. Let's go. These old-time American costumes and scenic backdrops had people lining up to relive the past. Some pictures, however, were more attractive than others. As you walk past the European Community Pavilion, you had to notice a giant sculpture out front. It stood 35 feet high and kids loved climbing on it. It was designed by a British artist and was based on a computer printout of a sunburst. And he's translated the sunburst into these ceramic tiles in these various colors to present the radiation and the heat of the sun. The artist was so particular about the color of tiles, he had them specially fired in Europe and shipped from there. Craftsmen representing North Carolina furniture makers built one of the biggest things on display. This giant bed, built by seven craftsmen, weighed 4,000 pounds. So how big is this thing? Well, the bed itself is 17 feet by 6 inches wide, 21 feet by 6 inches long, and 11 feet 11 inches high. The giant bed was covered by a giant quilt. 96 women made the quilt. Each 18-inch square was hand-sewn. In all, one million hand-sewn stitches held the giant masterpiece together. 
there have been those people who say there's not much sports going on here at the World's Fair so far, but if you look around, there's sports all over the place. In our travels today, we found your typical bench warmers and various race car drivers. In basketball, we saw a low post and then, of course, a double low post. We saw a pit stop and a first round draft choice. In baseball, you would call this next play a strikeout. We found a backfield in motion, a touchdown, and a goal. We saw a double dribble violation and a double foul. Then we saw a charging foul. And of course you have your uh, personal foul. A la Daryl Waltrip, we saw a pole sitter. So as you can see, there's plenty of sports going on here at the World's Fair each and every day. This is Bob Kessling, Action 10 Sports. And that's what you call a grand slam. Up next, the 1982 World's Fair was considered an instrument for peace. For six months, it brought nations together. It also brought individuals together. When we come back, we'll have a couple of love stories. More than 11 million people came through the turnstiles at the 1982 World's Fair. They went home with souvenirs, with pictures, with memories, and in a few cases, a new spouse. Carl Van Wagner proposed to Sandra Hopkins around lunchtime one day. By the time she got home from work that evening, he had the wedding all planned. He wanted to be married at the World's Fair. Sandra agreed, and on Memorial Day weekend, they came to Knoxville. Carl and Sandra Van Wagner will celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary at the end of this month. Carl says that 25 years have just flown by. Long lines have been one of the few major complaints of visitors here at the... When Channel 10's Rob Braun set out to do a story on the best way to avoid long lines at the fair's pavilions, he asked for advice from one of the volunteer hostesses. Jennifer McCall from VIP Services gives information to fair visitors all day long and suggests evenings as the best time to see the fair. Usually after dark it's pretty good. A lot of the tour buses leave like about 7 or 8 and so the lines go down after dark for sure. It's a lot cooler too. It was a nice interview and we, we did fine and we were uh, packing up to leave and the photographer kept elbowing me and he said, that girl likes you. He said, you need, you need to talk to that girl, find out who she is. And so I, you know, I thought about it and thought about it and we left and went home and did our package and then the next day I just happened to bump into her again. You know, somehow I, I, I found her. Rob and Jennifer had their first date on the 4th of July that year. By August 1st, they were engaged. Rob proposed near the Sun's Fair. They married six months later, toasting each other with a memento of the fair. 25 years later, they have two children and will celebrate their 25th anniversary next year. A silver anniversary is a wonderful time to reflect. We remember back to a community that worked together, overcame obstacles, achieved the impossible. Civic leaders with imagination and vision who took on a challenge, transformed a city. And East Tennesseans who showed the world what true Southern hospitality really is. I think the fair gave this region, I think it gave East Tennessee um, just a big jolt of confidence. And I tell you what, it was one of the most fun six months. It was like a UT football game every day. I mean, it was like a football Saturday every day. There was excitement in town. I mean, 100,000 people were, were out there average every day. So, I mean, you figured out it was just, it was a ton of fun. It was a UT Saturday every day. I'm a, a, a great believer in the philosopher Satchel Page. You know, don't look back, something might be gaining on you. So I, I think it was, it was really a, 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 quite a trip and, and, uh, and, and a lot of fun, a lot of challenges but uh, ended up being watching the people on the site having fun, watching the, 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 the children and the adults, particularly from Knoxville, who came many times, uh, all the fun they were having. Uh, that made it all worth it. We basically took Warhol's 15 minutes of fame and turned it into a 180-day uh, celebration of uh, just uh, cultural, uh, educational, um, economic benefits to the community. 
I absolutely loved every minute of the fair, even though it was a whole lot of hard work, um, principally because it was all live programming. Um, we had so much fun because we were all learning. We were young. We were cub reporters. Um, and we were doing, at minimum, five five-minute live cut-ins a day. And we just had to do the entertainment side of the fair. And that's what we did. We told folks what was going on at the World's Fair that day. And it was fun. There was not a day we went to work when we didn't just have a ball. But I think for those who, who did come and who did enjoy it, I think it really left a, a kind of permanent mark. And I think 25 years later, people, you know, I think still have good feelings about it. What would you like best? Well, you know, I hadn't even thought of that. I really hadn't. I, I think the, the pageantry and also being a former Marine, having the Commandant of the Marine down here, the Marine Corps band, and, and you know, it's just... Uh, very, very emotional and very patriotic. History is the ultimate judge of whether you fail or succeed. And the history has judged us kindly. My most significant memories of the 1982 World's Fair were all the broadcasts that we did live from here at the World's Fair site. I'll never forget May 1st, 1982. Bob Braun from Cincinnati, Margie Eisen, Edie Ellis and I hosted a five hour marathon live broadcast which included all the opening ceremonies. A marvelous time. For those six months we did every newscast here at the fair. There was a special World's Fair programming, the five minute programs, the wrap ups, the 30 minute Welcome World program at the end of the week. It was all such great fun. It was a once in a lifetime opportunity. I'm so glad that we were privileged to be a part of it. In the 25 years that have passed since the beginning of the fair, some of the old crew have moved on, some moved just down the street. But we're all bonded together with those special memories we had of that wonderful, glorious time. Because it was one of our stories. I'm Bill Williams. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.